Three Hells Angel members accused of that shooting on Sunday. We have been telling you stories about the 1% outlaw MCs since quite some time now. And you have heard a lot of names of the infamous presidents, reckless rebels, and even some outlaw MC members who have committed mass murders, but still got away with them. These stories may have made you think, how can they commit the crime so seamlessly? How can they be so cold? For years after years, the criminal specialists have extensively studied the activities within the outlaw groups. They identified a reason behind these activities which is rather disturbing. No matter at what age the members join the club, they start obsessing over the outlaw MCs at a very young age, which means the faces of the outlaw MCs, the ones who are always in the news, become their role models, no matter how infamous they are. It doesn't matter to them if these figures that they worship are there for all the wrong reasons. They visualize them as the vigilantes, the rebels without a cause, and imagine taking their place someday. Today, I am here to tell you about the five most infamous outlaw MC members in history and the dark life they lead. While talking about the most feared outlaw gang members, Sonny Barger has to be the chart topper. Sentenced to prison for a multiple times and being convicted in several crimes, this former president of Ontario, chapter not on a lie, kept going on with his criminal activities for years, but is proud enough to accept his involvement with illegal activities too. Barger was not the founder of the Hells Angels, as is often claimed. The group was founded in 1948, but he became its best known member to such an extent that he is often misidentified as the club's founder. He and the Oakland Hells Angels were initially unaware that there were several other loosely affiliated clubs using the same name throughout California. The founding members of the Oakland Hells Angels were basically honest blue collar or unskilled workers looking for excitement, according to George Baby Huey Weathern, who became the chapter vice president in 1960. Unlike the World War II veterans who formed the early Hells Angels chapters, Many of the founding members of the Oakland chapter were former servicemen with disreputable military records. Barger described his chapter as a wild bunch. Dear Mr. President, on behalf of myself and my associates, I volunteer a group of loyal Americans for behind-the-line duty in Vietnam. We feel that a crack group of trained guerrillas could demoralize the Viet Cong and advance the cause of freedom. Barger and the Hells Angels have been linked to drug trafficking operations, including the distribution of methamphetamine, cocaine, and marijuana. Barger has acknowledged his involvement in drug trafficking during the 1960s and 1970s. During these years, Berger has been involved in numerous violent incidents, both as a perpetrator and as a target. These include clashes with rival motorcycle clubs, confrontations with law enforcement, and internal disputes within the Hells Angels. During the reign of Barger, Hells Angels have been accused of engaging in racketeering activities, such as illegal gambling, extortion, and the operation of protection rackets. These activities are often used to generate revenue and exert control over their territories. Although, it's essential to note that while Barger has a history of involvement in criminal activities, he has also been an outspoken advocate for the rights of motorcyclists and has worked to improve the public image of the Hells Angels. In recent years, he has distanced himself from illegal behavior and has focused on writing and speaking about his experiences. While La E talking about Hells Angels, we can't ignore John Mortimer, AKA Johnny Angel. John Johnny Angel Mortimer was a notorious figure within the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, particularly during the 1960s and 1970s. He gained a fearsome reputation for his involvement in various criminal activities. Mortimer was known for his willingness to engage in violence and intimidation tactics. He was involved in numerous violent clashes with rival motorcycle clubs, as well as confrontations with law enforcement officers. Mortimer's reputation for brutality contributed to his fearsome image within the Hells Angels and the broader Outlaw Motorcycle Club community. Like many members of Outlaw Motorcycle Clubs during that era, 
Mortimer was involved in drug trafficking operations. He was implicated in the distribution of illegal drugs, including methamphetamine, cocaine, and marijuana. These activities were often used to fund the club's operations and lifestyle. Mortimer and other Hells Angels members were accused of engaging in racketeering activities such as extortion and the operation of protection rackets. They would allegedly demand money from businesses and individuals in exchange for protection from harm or vandalism. Apart from that, Mortimer and his associates were also allegedly involved in illegal gambling operations, including bookmaking and running underground casinos. These activities allowed them to generate additional revenue and expand their influence within their territories. Mortimer has been linked to several murders and contract killings, although specific details and evidence may vary. These violent acts were often carried out as part of ongoing disputes with rival motorcycle clubs or to eliminate individuals perceived as threats to the Hells Angels' interests. Overall, John Johnny Angel Mortimer's criminal activities were emblematic of the violent and lawless reputation associated with outlaw motorcycle clubs during the height of their power in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, let's shift the focus to the most dark and infamous of them all, Wayne Callistine. As you know from our previous episodes, Wayne Callistine was the founder of Bandidos. Although his criminal history takes place way before he formed, Bandidos dated back during his teenage days. Callistine has a long criminal record going back to 1967. In 2006, the Toronto Sun reported that since he turned 18 in 1967 that Kellestine amassed convictions for three counts of assault causing bodily harm, three for assault, three for possessing unregistered weapons, and more than a dozen counts for various weapons, property and breach and escape charges. In the summer of 1967, Kellestine, as an unruly teenager, went on a crime spree that led to three convictions for assault and assault causing bodily harm. When Kellestine was arrested in April 2006, a policeman told the journalist Timothy Appleby of the Globe and Mail, He's a guy who, if you were to meet him, the hair on your neck would stand on end. This is one scary individual. In Kellestine's 1982 trial for assault, one of the witnesses testified that it was widely known in criminal circles that Kellestine had, in 1978, murdered Giovanni Di Filippo, a Woodbridge, Ontario businessman. Di Filippo had been killed while answering his door by an assassin disguised as a pizza delivery man who pulled out a gun and shot him in the head. A police investigation established that Kellestine had almost certainly murdered Di Filippo, but there was insufficient evidence to bring charges against him. In 1982, Kellestine left Thorndale and purchased for $50,000 a farm near Iona Station at 32196 Aberdeen Line buying another 52.33 acres of adjoining farmland in 1987. In the 1990s, the Hells Angels were steadily taking over the outlaw biker scene in Canada, causing other bikers to turn to the Bandidos Club based in Houston, Texas as a counter. On 7 April 1998, Jeffrey Labrache and Jody Hart, two leaders of the outlaws biker gang, were gunned down leaving a strip club, the Beef Baron, by two men known to be associated with the Hells Angels in London, Ontario. Labrache was the president of the London chapter of the Outlaws. His killers were brothers Paul and Dwayne Lewis. On 15th of December 1998, a London millionaire businessman, Salvatore Vecchio, who was widely believed to be linked with the Hells Angels, was murdered. Because Vecchio's body was found close to Kellestine's farm, and due to the similarity with O'Neill's murder in 1992, Police believe that Kellestine was involved in Vecchio's murder and may have been the gunman who killed him. In August 2004, after being released from prison following his conviction on gun and drug charges, Kellestine became the Sargento de Armas of the Canadian Bandidos and was displeased at the way his former protege Muscadere now overshadowed him. And you already know about the Shedden Massacre that took place in 2006, where Kalestine and his fellow gang members brutally murdered other gang members in Kalestine's farmhouse. While talking about the rivals of Hell's Angels, one can't forget about Harry Taco Bowman. Harry Joseph Bowman, also known as Taco, 
was an American outlaw biker and gangster who served as the international president of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club between 1984 and 1999. During his tenure as president, the club had chapters in more than 30 cities in the United States and some 20 chapters in at least four other countries. Considered one of the most notorious motorcycle gang leaders in U.S. history, Bowman escalated a biker war between the Outlaws and the Hells Angels in the 1990s. He became the 453rd fugitive listed on the FBI 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list after he was indicted on federal racketeering and murder charges in August 1997. After 18 months as a fugitive, Bowman was apprehended by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, near Detroit in June 1999. He was convicted in Tampa, Florida in April 2001 of the murders of gang members, firebombings, racketeering, conspiracy, and various drug and firearm offenses. Bowman was sentenced to serve two life prison sentences plus 83 years. On November 14, 1996, Wayne Hicks and Houston Murphy were among 10 Outlaws members arrested after being indicted on federal racketeering charges. The indictments were the culmination of Operation Silver Spoke, a six-year Drug Enforcement Administration investigation into murders, robberies, bombings, drug trafficking, extortion and witness intimidation carried out by the outlaws in Florida. Facing the possibility of life imprisonment, Hicks and Murphy turned state's evidence and testified against various outlaws members, including Bowman. According to Maryland State Police biker gang expert, Lieutenant Terry Katz, Hicks became the highest ranking outlaw in its national organization to cooperate with federal prosecutors. Katz described the significance of Hicks's cooperation as, in the world of motorcycle gangs, this is like Sammy the Bull Gravano telling all he knows about John Gotti. Bowman was indicted on 10 counts, four of racketeer influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act violations, four of drug trafficking, one of explosives violations, and another of illegal firearm possession by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Florida in 1997. Bowman went on trial in Tampa beginning on March 19, 2001, on 10 counts involving crimes committed between 1980 and 1997. On April 17, 2001, after a month-long trial, Bowman was convicted on eight counts, four counts of violating the RICO Act via 13 acts of racketeering, including the murders of Raymond Chaffin and Don Fogg, the kidnappings of Erwin Nissen and Kevin Talley, the bombings of Warlocks and Hell's henchmen clubhouses, the assault on the fifth chapter, and conspiracy to murder members of rival gangs. Three counts of opium, cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana, and Valium distribution, and one count of possessing a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol as a convicted felon. He was acquitted on an arson charge. Graham Brink of the Tampa Bay Times wrote that Bowman took the news that he was about to spend the rest of his life behind bars with the casual cool that he has displayed throughout his month-long trial. While we are at it, let's talk about Donald Eugene Chambers, who was probably the first outlaw MC member who started the illegal activities with his dark and twisted mindset. Chambers served as a Marine in the Vietnam War. Upon returning to Texas, he was employed as a longshoreman and became a member of numerous motorcycle clubs. Finding these various clubs too tame for his tastes, Chambers founded his own, the Bandidos, on March 4, 1966, in San Leon, Texas. He named the club in honor of the Mexican bandits who lived by their own rules and chose the club's colors, red and gold, after the official colors of the U.S. recruiting members from biker bars locally in Houston, as well as in Corpus Christi, Galveston, and San Antonio. The club had over 100 members, including many Vietnam veterans by the early 1970s. In 1969, Chambers oversaw the abduction beating and handing over to police of a Bandidos member who was wanted for a murder unrelated to club business, which was drawing unwanted attention from law enforcement to the club. Chambers later moved to New Mexico after he was involved in a deadly shootout with a rival gang at a bar in East End, Houston, where they had gone to discuss a peace agreement. On December 22, 1972, 
Chambers, along with two fellow Bandidos members, drove two drug dealers out in the desert, made the dig their own grave, shot them, and set their bodies on fire. The trio received a life sentence after the trial. They say no human can be completely black or white. They come in the shades of gray. But you got to admit, whole hearing about some of these incidents, you must have felt that you are listening to a saga of someone who harbors darkness like a pure evil. Should they be labeled as monsters for setting an example so dark that it has spread like poison in the minds of the youth, or their heinous actions can still somehow be justified? I'll leave that up to you. If you want to know more about any other Outlaw MC member that we missed to mention, let us know in the comments section below.